uh, normal uh, bone healing pathology. Uh, so the bio, uh, biology of bone healing, we have primary and secondary. Uh, the primary uh, bone healing requires direct reduction, um, which you'll see with uh, direct healing uh, with fractures that are reduced um, or you know, fractures that are reopposed. Uh, requires an increased uh, stability <clears throat> and a low strain. So uh, this is when the um, practical fragments uh, have less than uh, 2% of um, uh, mobility uh, in their environment around the, the fracture uh, portions themselves. Um, the Haversian canals, so that's how they remodel. Uh, you have you know, two opposing uh, areas that have um, uh, direct bone-to-bone -bone contact, uh, and then you have no callus formation. Uh, whereas the secondary bone healing, you have um, uh, indirect reduction um, and relative stability, uh, whether or not it's you know um, by uh, casting or uh, by um, uh, uh, reduction with uh, internal or um, external fixation, um, requires some high strain. So uh, greater than two percent of the fraction uh, or fracture uh, environment. Um, and you have this callus formation that um, forms between uh, one area of the bone uh, and then the other. So the construct itself for fixation, um, um, the uh, patient factors uh, come into play, the fracture personality, uh, which is you know, how that fracture actually um, uh, came to be um, uh, broken. Uh, and then that determines what kind of fixation construct you want to place inside the patient. Um, that fracture personality encompasses uh, an anatomical location, the fracture pattern, the bone quality, the soft tissue status. Uh, so you have simple and complex or comminuted fractures. Uh, the simple fracture patterns um, usually are treated with a direct reduction um, and then your, your definitive or absolute stability. Uh, and then your complex or common fractures usually are treated with indirect reduction uh, and then uh, relative stability, or you, you, know, you get it as, as close to reduction as you can uh, anatomically. And then you um, <clears throat> kind of rely on the, the bone itself or the body to uh, create that uh, bridging between the two uh, portions of the fracture. So fracture stability, the absolute and relative. So absolute um, stability involves direct visualization uh, anatomical reduction, whether it's um, you know, with um, uh, offset drilling or um, uh, manual compression of the fracture portions, uh, and then placing some kind of stable fixation. Um, this is where we use our lag screws, our compression plating um, to get that fracture back to where we want it to be. Uh, relative stability um, involves that indirect reduction uh, and that indirect uh, fixation. Uh, you're restoring axial, angu angular, and rotational alignment. Uh, again, this is where our, we have our um, very comminuted, um, very uh, displaced fractures. Uh, and you want to preserve that biological environment of the fracture, meaning the periosteum, the arterial supply, uh, venous return of the, um, the nearby structures. Um, and this is where we um, reduce them via um, intermediary rods, bridging, bridge plating, external fixation, or even um, uh, casting with uh, immobilization. Yeah, so simple pearls, I mean, to put that together, when you're thinking these simple fractures, simple clean break fractures, associate that always with you want absolute stability, be able to give examples, lag screws, compression plates versus complex comminuted fractures. You're going for relative stability in those situations and examples, like he said, X-fix, IM nails, things like that. Um, so make those two associations depending on the type of fracture pattern that you have. And one of the reasons we try to talk about AO fixation as much as we can is to try to prevent uh, these non-unions. So when you are looking at a non-union because of maybe poor fixation or poor host, um, it's important to identify different types of non-unions. Um, so does anybody want to take a guess at which of the x-rays is an atrophic and which one's a hypertrophic? Um, the one on the right is atrophic. 
I can faintly hear, but yes, the right is atrophic where we see no bridging, we see no callus formation. On the left, we see it almost looks like an arthritic joint, right? You have periarticular osteophyte formation. We see hardware where the bone is actually overgrowing it distally there. And you have a broken screw uh, for that lag screw. So that usually means less, uh, st less stable of a fixation. Um, whereas the one on the right, the atrophic is usually more of a poor host. So adding bone graft on the right versus better fixation on the left or better non-weight bearing or just adequate joint preparation. So if you're reading those x-rays to someone in clinic, right, you get points for saying, well, I see a non-union, you get more points for being more specific and saying that it's either an atrophic or a hypertrophic non-union. So try to be able to recognize those. So the graph here <clears throat> excuse me, uh, just shows the uh, spectrum of stability uh, between the relative uh, stability and the absolute. Mm -hmm. So, excuse me, uh, casting obviously is our relative stability. You have no internal fixation. Uh, you have no um, bones that you're visualizing. Um, and that kind of goes up uh, from X fixed to bridge plating, IM nails to compression uh, plating and lag screws uh, to our um, absolute or more uh, rigid constructs where you, we do not see cows formation uh, as long as the healing occurs in a, a normal state. Uh, you have don't you do not have that uh, callus formation. So our hybrid fixation, this type uh, of fixation involves a combination of our absolutes uh, and our relative um, stability uh, principles or fixations. Uh, so this is where we have, you know, a direct reduction uh, with um, some kind of um, uh, plating or, or direct visualization of uh, the fracture fragments where you're putting an endofrag screw and reducing it, uh, and then also adding to it uh, bridge plating uh, or, you know, some kind of uh, relative stability uh, for the um, uh, metaphyseal diaphyseal junction. So what are we trying to um, accomplish with this inter internal fixation? What kind of goals and um, uh, long-term you know, fixation are we trying to um, uh, create? Yeah, so, our, sorry. so our goals are restoring the uh, anatomical, uh, the bony uh, anatomy while respecting soft tissues. Uh, we have uh, stable fixation, accelerated recovery, you know, more predictable and potentially faster healing, especially with uh, well-opposed bony opposition where we're not trying to bridge uh, a large gap. Um, and when are we doing this? So this is when we have displaced inter interarticular fractures uh, or displaced fractures in general. Uh, we have open fractures, uh, polytrauma associated uh, neurovascular injuries, um, and then failure of closed treatment uh, via um, uh, casting uh, or um, uh, even traction injuries. I, I see here that Zach added in the chat room, non-unions come up quite often in externships. Um, some can get tricky and ask different types of hypertrophic and atrophic. He's right. There's even subcategories of those, um, which, you know, you should be familiar with them. Um, we treat atrophic and hypertrophic differently. So you want to be able to offer treatment plans too, not just be able to answer what type it is. So we have multiple functions of fixation, um, <clears throat> whether or not it's, uh, you know, uh, stability or, or compression uh, or just, um, you know, temporary fixation. Um, so we'll go through some terminology that I think is uh, really important when you're looking at fixation. So lag screws are really important. Uh, you'll hear that terminology thrown around a lot. Uh, so that's the interfragmentary compression. Uh, that's where you um, essentially have uh, two bones um, and you're compressing those um, to each other, whether or not it's, you know, um, a fracture fragment uh, or an osteotomy, uh, but either way you have these lag screws that uh, compress the uh, two fragments together. Then we have plates. Uh, so you'll hear a lot of these terminologies um, uh, thrown around quite a bit. Um, and I think really to get a grasp of which each, 
what each kind of plate uh, actually does um, to be able to discuss these uh, on your externships, on your interviews, et cetera, um, is really important. Uh, you know, just tr throwing out the word, um, you know, tension banding uh, is one thing, but actually understand um, the uh, functionality of, of these plating systems or these compression systems uh, is really important. So we have neutralization, buttress, or anti glide, we have tension banding, compression, bridge plating, um, locking plates. Um, and then intramedullary nails. Uh, nails. So, um, you know, with the IM nails, uh, we essentially have an internal splint. Uh, there's not really much um, compression, et cetera, that uh, happens with IM nails uh, besides across joints. Um, so these are uh, splinting the patient uh, essentially with uh, internal fixation and then keeping them there until it heals. Bridge plating is an internal splint as well. Um, external fixation, obviously external splinting and then uh, casting is uh, external splinting uh, with um, uh, no um, pins or um, half pins or screws going through the leg. So I, I think I right here to show a few different examples. Um, if we actually look at the two independent screws, the one in the tibia going from the medial mal um, in and then the one in the fibula by itself, those are examples of lag screws. Uh, because they are holding the fragments together, uh, usually as close to perpendicular as you can get. And then that lateral fibular plate there is a neutralization plate. And we'll cover this more um, in a little bit, but if you notice the small screw, that's the lag screw in the fibula, um, it's fully threaded compared to that cannulated screw in the medial mal, and we can tell it's cannulated because we can see this hollow center to it, as well as it has a blunt tip, so it has to go over that guide wire, whereas all the screws in the plate um, appear to be tipped, so those are solid screws. Um, just the, these are two that are overlapped, so that throws it off a little bit. Um, but when you are putting screws in, the lag screw in the fibula, that one would need to be applied per standard lag technique, Whereas when you're going through the medial mal, because this cannulated screw is only partially threaded, then that's lag by design where you have the threads grip distally and compressed to the head. So you don't have to do your over drill, under drill, et cetera. And Sarah adds, so Preston adds that he had an entire interview about hypertrophic, natrophic. Thank you for the support. It's, it's a big deal. Um, and then Sarah adds, know how to explain the types of plates quickly. I was asked at multiple places to list them and describe what they do as well as specific types of fractures um, that you, you use them with. I think one of the more common things that we see with this fibular type fracture is sometimes you try to get, you use some fancier terms that you may have heard. And some people will end up calling this an anti-glide plate um, where that's usually on the back of the posterior aspect of the fibula. Um, so this is just a normal neutralization plate. You'll be, you'll be exposed um, to a lot of different screw type, uh, and it's very important to uh, really get a grasp on, you know, terminology and utilizing it uh, appropriately. Um, so most of the screws of these three categories will all be, you know, one screw will be described by um, three different um, terminologies. So it's important to not just throw out one or you know, one and a half uh, terminologies for a screw when you're describing it or you're shown a screw and, and told to describe it. So the first category is whether it's a solid or a cannulated screw. Obviously a cannulated screw has a, um, a hole in the middle uh, to be able to uh, throw a guide wire and then throw the screw over top of it. Solid screw, obviously more uh, robust uh, and uh, thicker um, with no a hollow portion to it um, versus the cannulated screw. Then you have a cancellus versus the cortical uh, screws. Uh, cancellus having uh, tighter pitches, uh, cortical screw having wider pitches um, uh, of the um, screw threads. And then we have a locking and versus the non-locking screw. Uh, the locking obviously going into uh, plates, uh, non-locking being able to go um, uh, through uh, no no hardware in between the bone and itself, 
um, and also through uh, plates themselves as well. So a locking screw, uh, that, that screw head actually locks into the plate, creating that uh, fixed angle device uh, that can be uh, cortical, cancellous, solid, or cannulated. Uh, and either way, <clears throat> that um, locking screw uh, is able to um, act as a um, secondary cortice of a bone. So this is where locking screws can uh, only cross uh, through one other um, courtesy of a bone uh, because the plate itself acts like a courtesy. Um, so versus the, um, the non-locking screws that have to cross across the two um, uh, courtesies of the bone, these locking screws can uh, utilize the plate itself uh, for a point of, point of fixation. I think too that this is this is a good point to bring up because this is one of probably the common uh, mistakes that I see when I read either you know either operative reports or either your X-ray reads that you write on uh, patient notes in clinic um, is that you know students tend to get really descriptive of how many screws are in a plate. So, you know, this is a status post first MPJ fusion, and there are six screws in this plate. And it, versus describing how many screws there are doesn't matter. Um, so save that and instead describe what type of screws are used. So describing or being able to describe that this is a, you know, a fully threaded cortical screw, or this is, you know, a partially threaded, non-locking headed screw, much, much more important and much more applicable to the person or the surgeon who comes along next and may have to go in and take that out, um, or who may want to understand if they're reading a report why hardware might have failed. So I care much less that there were six versus five screws in that plate and much more the types of screws that were used. So think about that when you write x-ray reads or when you describe x-rays. Um, and yes, I see in the chat, Brooke, you are correct that I threw up these two x-rays to show you all these different examples of screws. So if we're looking at this lateral fibular plate over here, um, we noticed that the screw heads are elevated off of the plate, whereas on the anterior tibial plate here, the screw heads are buried in. So when you have the head sitting on top of the plate, it gets compression um, via the plate to the bone that way versus the screw just locking into the plate for one solid construct on the other side. When you're identifying screws, locking, non-locking, et cetera, we talked about the raised head, head being a non-locking screw or a cortical screw. Um, when we look distally, there's different types of them. So around the distal tip of the fibula, we see the uh, more narrow uh, thread diameter or thread height um, in this cortical screw right here. And then we have the wider thread pitch on the distal screw, it's more cancellous. Uh, this is one of the times we use a cancellous screw because we don't wanna use a cortical one and actually go into the lateral gutter here. Um, sometimes you'll see them both angled, sometimes it's just one angled. But when you see that, that higher uh, thread pitch, we know it's a cancellous screw there. And if we look at the ankle fusion on the left here, we have a bunch of locking screws in there. Uh, but you can tell the difference between these two, even though you can't see the head being raised up where it takes that bend, we can see the difference in thread pitch where we have an actual cortical screw with a wider thread pitch here versus a locking screw. So the locking screws will have the most narrow of thread pitches um, of all the screws. And then we have, excuse me, we have this uh, cannulated partially threaded screw as your compression screw, your lag screw, your, your home run screw, if you're talking about an ankle fusion. So this is just going into uh, the uh, mechanics of uh, actual locking versus non-locking screws. Um, so on the left-hand side, you have the tightening of the screw compression uh, of the plate to the bone, um, and that um, creates this, um, with the non-locking screws, it creates this compression where the, the plate actually gets bent to the bone um, to keep that, that construct stable. Uh, versus the locking screws that actually uh, thread into the plate. And as soon as that plate uh, gets engaged by the screws um, and then uh, the opposing bone, uh, everything be becomes 
a very <clears throat> angular stable construct. So everything kind of sucks um, uh, together uh, becomes one stable construct. So here are examples. Um, I know one of the questions that we talked about was uh, different screw types as well. And I want to eliminate a point of confusion because we've been talking about a lot of locking screws over the last few slides. And these are two examples of uh, calcaneal axial images. And on the left here, we see there's two cannulated, headed, partially threaded screws for this calcaneal slide osteotomy. And on the right, we have two cannulated, partially threaded headless. So we don't have this head here. We have threads there instead, and that's going to gain compression because we have a different thread pitch distally versus on the head. Don't confuse these as a locking screw. I think when we see people first learn yeah, to talk a, about that's this. That's a really good point. Yeah. It, it can happen. Yeah. So we, we use a headless compression screw where you don't want to have the head be more prominent. And you can clearly see here that the head is buried into the calcaneus on the right. Um, and we can do it maybe for bunions. You can use it in the midfoot. You can really use them wherever you want to. Um, you're going to use them in places where you just don't want somebody to feel a prominent head. So on the heel, we may use it because we don't want them walking on the, on the screw heads, but you have to remember that over years, if they're in there and you have to take out one of these headless compression screws, there's a really good chance that bony overgrowth has occurred. So you're probably going to have to chip away at it first before you even get to the screw itself. Um, so if you plan on taking a screw out, no matter what, then it's probably a good idea to do a headed screw just to get the fusion that you need. And then you can take it out later because it'll be easier. So the anatomy of a screw is something that um, it can pop up on boards. Uh, there's a lot of detail to the anatomy of the screw. We talk about the overall length of the screw, um, the thread length. So you may hear people ask about thread length. And if you're trying to go, if you're fusing across a joint, maybe a subtilar joint, and the rep says, well, do you want half threads or, or one third threads? Or you may hear us say, how long are the threads? So yeah, a lot of times they'll say, do you want short thread or long thread? And that way, if you don't have as much room on the opposite side of your fusion or your osteotomy, you, you want shorter threads there. So this, the thread length may only be, you know, 10, 15 millimeters. So they're all the way across the osteotomy site. Um, when you're talking about, uh, all right, a couple of questions popped up on boards part two, I see. So other things that can be important, obviously, is your core diameter and your thread diameter when you're putting in a screw, the thread pitch. Um, questions that can be answered um, or questions that are asked commonly is the runout. So the runout is where the shaft meets the threads. And that's actually important because it's the weakest part of the screw. So it's the part that's most likely to break. So oftentimes we see cannulated screws that are broken right there. Um, and then the land of the screw is where it actually comes into contact with the plate or the bone. Remember that that runout is the weakest part of the screw. So a couple of different functions of the screw itself, um, really four in, in general. Uh, so you have a positional screw, which has a, a neutral effect on everything. Uh, it does not compress it. It does not um, uh, bring you know uh, two joints or two bones together. Uh, it's essentially just a, a neutral effect on the fragment position. This is where we um, place things together manually uh, and then throw a screw that holds those things together. We have our uh, plate screws, uh, which can be locking or non-locking. Um, the the non-locking provides uh, friction between the plate and the bone uh, via the compression, uh, and that creates that angular stability. And then our, um, our polar uh, or blocking screw, uh, which is used to indirect uh, eye, um, intermedullary nail fixation, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and then our lag screws. Um, so again, uh, just to reiterate what a lag screw is, that's an inner fragment uh, compression. Um, we can have both um, fully threaded, uh, but also partially threaded if you're trying to get compression by design, um, uh, which can both create that lag effect. Um, so you can still get the lag screw uh, compression with a fully threaded screw if you're doing 
uh, lag by um, technique versus lag by design. Um, some of our um, uh, partially threaded screws, uh, those are gonna be by design. So uh, they'll lag or, or compress those two joint surfaces or fragment surfaces um, because of the way that screw is designed uh, versus the technique. Um, lag back technique, which is where you're going to use those fully threaded screws. When we look at this image right here, um, it shows a couple different ways that we can actually get some compression. So when we're talking about the actual screws, these two screws that go across the first tarsal or tarsal joint, those are your actual fusion screws. So those ones were likely put in by lag technique. But when you see the screw growing from the first to the second ray, there's a good chance that that screw is just put in as a positional screw. Uh, sometimes what we do is we get a little bit more spring at the one, two IM angle after we do the fusion. So we wanna hold that down. Um, you can do that with just a solid screw across. Um, you can also put a clamp across first to hold it and then put your positional screw and then let it go and see if it springs open. Um, but those are just different examples there. So again, just to reiterate the important portion of lag by technique versus lag by design. Um, when you lag by technique, you're, you have um, a fully threaded screw, um, which uh, is uh, over drilled on the uh, proximal portion um, and then under drilled uh, throughout the entire and through the distal portion. Uh, that proximal screw, which is the gliding hole is drilled with the diameter of the screw thread. Um, allows for um, the fully threaded screw to compress by your technique uh, versus the lag by design, um, which is where you have um, a screw that only has threads in the distal most portion. Uh, so those partially threaded screws act as a lag screw. Um, and as soon as they engage, um, they'll compress that bony prominence or bony fragment um, until it um, uh, runs out of um, uh, the threads um, and then suck that down to actually lag um, by the design of the screw itself. So when we're talking about the technique of the screw, uh, we have another graphic on the next page, but you'll hear this is an example for a 3-5 cortical screw. You're going to over drill approximately with that 3-5 because you don't want the threads to engage in that. Uh, and then you're going to under drill with a 2-5, which is usually the core diameter of the screw, although every company is going to be different. I think, I don't know how the externs were this past year, but I remember as an extern having to memorize all these screw sizes and under drills and everything, but then you get out into there practice. There weren't as and, many sets then. <laughs> yeah, there's so many sets now. And one company may do a 2.5 for an under drill because that's their core diameter. And the next one is a 2.6. So I think as long as you understand the principles, I'd rather you have that understood than trying to memorize like those AO charts. Um, something else too is if you over drill first, um, there are some older guides in the set that may be like called a top hat or a mushroom guide. Basically it centers up your under drill so that way you get it in the center of your drill hole. Um, but there's also some people who like to just do the under drill first and go all the way through. And then just with the over drill, you just have to pop that proximal cortex. So either of those can achieve the same thing. Um, you want to remember though, that you're going to countersink before you measure, cause that's going to remove a little bit more bone. And that countersink can prevent stress risers as long as, as well as getting the head to sit a little bit lower. And then you measure um, before you tap. So we don't really tap anymore, but maybe on like a fifth met screw, you might tap. You want to measure so you don't alter your tap guy, the little, I guess the flutes that you're creating in there yeah, in the bone. With the tap. With the tap. So you're measuring first. Um, and then tap and then insert the screw. And I think the important thing with this is don't just memorize, you know, everybody just memorizes over drill, under drill, measure tap, screw. Understand why do I over drill? Why do I have to countersink? Why do I have to tap? Um, and be able to explain that to someone. Yeah. And sometimes you might encounter in surgery that you take that over drill or somebody hand you the wrong bit and you use it as the under drill and you kind of blow through that distal cortex. So by knowing what size that was, it can allow you to size up and screw and go to the next screw larger. So here's just a, a graphic of that that just reiterates everything. Another, so when we're talking about 
place into the screw. We all know that you want to get as perpendicular to the fracture line as, fracture line as possible to get the most compression that you can. Um, you get more shear forces if it's more perpendicular to the long axis of bone. So usually we try to get approximate or perpendicular to that fracture line, but there are times when you can't. So you have to decide, is it better to use a screw in that regard, or is it better to use a plate in that situation? So really similar when you think about those two positions, whether it's perpendicular to your osteotomy side or your fracture line, or perpendicular to the long axis of the bone, think about how we fixate typically a closing base wedge. So it's the same type of principles there. You're utilizing both screw positions to prevent shortening, um, prevent shearing forces and get compression across your osteotomy. So the plates themselves have a lot of uh, function. <clears throat> Neutralization is um, one of our uh, first ones we always utilize. Um, it's essentially um, neutralizing or protecting the lag screws uh, from shear or bending forces. Um, so you have your lag screw that's kind of um, your driving force of, of what your reduction uh, wants to be or, or you know, where you want everything to be. Uh, and then you have a neutralization plate uh, that actually uh, locks um, that position and gives it that extra support or neutralizes it. Um, so those can either be locking or non-locking plates. Um, and uh, with a lot of our um, procedures, we have a combination of um, locking and non-locking screws that we utilize um, for the same purpose of neutralization. Yeah, so these <laughs> are just some more common neutralization plates to see. Um, we'll get to more of these later. So buttress plating or anti-glide plating, uh, it's our second um, uh, big category. Um, <clears throat> and I think being able to utilize uh, these terms is really important. Um, so when you're um, applying to a metaphyseal fracture to support some intra-articular fragments, um, usually if a stiff plate is used, uh, the contouring to the local anatomy uh, is necessary because you want that thing to sit down and not compromise the uh, adjacent soft tissues. Uh, but free contoured anatomy plates also can be used as anti-glide plates because, you know, like I said, what you're doing is um, creating a, a buttress type um, construct that doesn't allow for the bone to move um, with your uh, primary fixation of your anti or um, um, uh, intraarticular uh, or interfragmentary um, screw fixation. When applied to di diaphyseal fractures, the anti glide effect leads to compression uh, within the fracture itself with axial loading. Um, and the, both uh, neutralization, or sorry, uh, both neutralize uh, vertical shear forces uh, during axial loading. So again, what it's doing, um, what this plate is doing is preventing any kind of sliding of your osteotomies or of your fracture uh, portions and preventing shortening of the fracture fragments themselves. A uh, bunch of plate, plate can also affect um, uh, or, or can uh, be obtained with a uh, screw with a washer at the apex of the fracture. Uh, those are usually utilized at the distalmost portions of a medial alveolar fracture. Uh, but anything that's that's preventing um, your fracture or your osteotomy from um, translocating either proximally or distally um, is what those buttress or anti-glide plates do. And this is a really bad one on the top right here, but sometimes you can actually see in a more simple fracture, vertical fracture um, of your medial mal. Sometimes people actually just put two screws across and basically use the force of the plate to just suck down that fragment and it won't move then um, without getting actually a lag screw across that way. So you can just put them directly across um, and prevent that telescoping proximally. Here's just the example of it. Uh, again, it, I mean, it's more common on the knee um, at the proximal tibia, um, but we do see it in the foot and ankle as the images we saw posterior fibula there and vertical medial malfractures. So compression plates um, also provide um, rigid fixation um, and absolute stability. Uh, so these are, are uh, you know, not using uh, intra-fragmentary or um, compression screws. Uh, so they're 
very helpful for transverse fractures where lag screw placement is impossible. Uh, so our high PER fractures or, or mid shaft PER fractures uh, this is where our compression plates are utilized probably the most. Um, can be accomplished by plate design. Uh, so you kind of have uh, that dynamic compression principle within the plate itself. Uh, you can overbend the plate. So when it um, sucks down to the bone, it actually does the compression for you. Um, you can use an external uh, tension device, um, whether or not it comes in the kit or you um, utilize some kind of hinterman or reverse hinterman uh, compression uh, or a combination of all those things. Um, it can be used alone or a combination with lag screws uh, utilized. Uh, usually we use uh, these when you can't get some kind of lag screw and you're not putting a neutralization plate on, you wanna uh, combine your lag screw uh, with um, even more compression uh, or if you're not happy with your compression, um, that's usually when you utilize these um, uh, combination uh, compression screws, uh, or, sorry, compression plates with compression screws. And these are two examples of compression plates. This top one isn't being utilized as intended because this lag screw is going through where that hole would be. But when you see this oblong hole here, that's when you start to have the ramp built into the plate. So that way, when you put your screw in, the screw head or the land actually slides down that ramp and it moves the plate um, while your screw is going into the bone and gets your dynamic compression that way. So it's that oblong hole that's important. Another type of compression plate that I would think technology has made it more abundant lately. I don't know if it was that prominent so long ago, but we have these uh, plates that have a little slot in it. And this example is all the way in the end, some are in the center, but you actually put a compression screw through the plate and the land of the screw makes contact with the plate and helps suck it down that way. Um, so there's different ways you can have a compression plate. This is kind of me touching on the eccentric, um, what we saw with that one plate beforehand, where the eccentric hole. So you wanna remember that you're gonna drill away from the fracture um, so that way that the screw is going into the bone and pulling the plate towards it. I think this is something that whenever you're in a lab, this is a good opportunity to like, just look at these and actually take a screw and put it into a dynamic hole and watch it kind of slide down. Um, this is something that it can be difficult to understand the concept. Um, so once you actually get some hands on it, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I agree. I think this is better utilized under, under a, you know, a cadaver lab or even a, a bone saw lab uh, where you just, you know, create some kind of fracture um, and then um, plate on the, you know, if you're staring straight down at the fracture on the left-hand side, you have some fixed fixation, um, some locking screws or, um, you know, into a plate. Uh, and then on the right side, you do that drill away from the fracture portion uh, and you kind of watch when you when you actually screw in the screw um, in that oblong hole, it sucks everything back um, to a anatomical position, uh, be a design of the, the plate itself. The other the th other thing too is actually plate bending, uh, which we utilize a lot uh, in the operating room. Uh, so. Um, without pre-bending the plate, there are um, compression uh, that you can do within the plate itself. Um, so a lot of times the pre-bending results in evenly um, uh, distributed forces across the fracture site. Um, but if you want to get some kind of compression, uh, not bending the plate um, and then utilizing the compression itself that you're gonna get, uh, like we were just talking about in that indirect compression, um, can be utilized by uh, drilling on the offset um, oblong holes of, of a plate. And then bridge plating is kind of our final um, uh, technique, I think. Um, it, you, it's um, for very comminuted fractures. Uh, so you're essentially doing exactly what it, um, that, that word 
you know, has in its meaning. Um, you always think of the, the river uh, with, you know, really either crappy bone or comminuted bone or destroyed bone from some kind of trauma. Uh, and what you're doing is you're creating um, a construct over top of that quote unquote river um, to um, allow for stability across that, those two areas. So this is for highly comminuted metaphyseal diaphyseal fractures, um, or where there's um, you know overlying soft tissues that do not allow you to uh, do a direct approach to the fracture. Um, but really, the goal is of a bridge plate uh, is to bypass heavy dissection, uh, and you want to preserve that that um, uh, periosteal what's left of the uh, blood supply to the bone. Um, so you fix a, approximately you fix a distally uh, and you let everything in the middle um, try to um, uh, heal and um, become one again and you know, fill in with bone. Um, anatomical reduction and absolute stability is, is definitely not achieved with this, uh, but rather you're doing some indirect uh, reduction and a relative stability, meaning um, you know, it's stable enough um, on the two portions, approximately and distally or uh, medial and lateral to the fracture, but the fracture itself is um, fairly unstable. So you have that bridge connecting the two stable portions. And I think sometimes we see this uh, more common as well as maybe if we use a bone graft and don't want to put a screw across it, or in Charco cases where we're trying to span across the affected joints there. So that plate span ratio of um, uh, three for comminuted fractures, uh, you want to get as many um, um, cortices on both sides um, of the, the plate itself. Um, when bridging a, a, a simple fracture, the use of relatively longer plates and increase um, screw spread of the innermost screws uh, result uh, in a uh, lower implant strain. So. Um, again, you know, the better the distribution, um, the better for it, or the better for the stability. So um, we have the locking um, and then the non-locking plates. Um, so in locking plates, the screw heads lock into the plate for stability. Um, uh, they provide axial and anchor stability. So, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you catch one cortex or two, um, that plate, or that, sorry, that screw uh, locks into the plate and then acts as, um, you know, a, a stable construct for it. Uh, in a locking construct, the load is transferred through the entire construct um, instead of just between the bone and the screw, uh, which is the case for locking or non-locking screws. Uh, their failure is typically due to fatigue fracture um, of the plate. So whenever you see a broken locking screw uh, in a locking plate. Usually it's actually at the um, interface between the plate and the screw uh, versus, you know, intramedullary or um, across uh, joint joint surfaces. Um, that's Something where you see Point out on the left X-ray where the left fracture is, is that if you look at the screws proximally, they were the plate was on the bone and you put your locking screws in and it holds that position but if you look distally here when you put your locking screw in your whatever position the plate is off the bone that position's bought and you can't change it so if you do think that the plate is off the bone a little bit and you don't want to take it off and rebend it then you probably are best if you swap out that locking screw and put in a cortical screw and see if you can engage in this distal cortex there and suck the plate down. Um, sometimes if you have a good, big enough screw or the plate's thin enough, then you can really get it bent. Um, otherwise you may just have to take it off and rebend it. Yeah, that's a good point because just because you have a, you're utilizing a locking plate does not mean you have to fill it with all locking screws. If you're trying to get that plate, like 
Rosante just said down down on the bone. I think you'll find that a lot of people just utilize locking screws or probably I should say over utilize locking screws because they're faster. Uh, you do not have to be bicortical. You don't have to be as precise on the measurements. So a lot of times we just tend to fill with locking screws. Um, as far as yep. whether the plate has some give, um, it does. So if you are putting in a cortical screw and you're engaging distally in that cortex, you can actually get a couple millimeters of bend um, and suck that plate down. So you may hear that term of that plate needs sucked down. And that usually just means swap out whatever screw you have, put in a, a cortical screw and get it to engage in that distal cortex. And it, you, you can probably get that plate to bend down. Just depends on how thick the plate is. I guess we kind of just talked about this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I... yeah. So I think everyone knows this uh, probably because of a, a video of an apple being ripped out of, or a plate being ripped out of an apple. Uh, but these are um, locking technology were really, um, you know, created for osteoporotic bone and combinated metatarsal fractures uh, or sorry, metaphyseal fractures. Um, by using bridge plating and, and utilizing the um, construct of the plate itself for stability um, versus, um, uh, you know, relying on the bone itself, because uh, obviously you're going to have comminuted or osteoporotic bone, uh, which pops up in your cases, um, and you can't just throw a normal um, uh, non-locking cortical screw through it. A lot of implants do um, have anatomical, um, you know, pre-contoured. Um, they utilize, you know, CT scans of thousands of cadavers to figure out what a normal contoured uh, anatomical plate will be. Um, but, you know, as a general uh, warning, uh, don't rely on these plate designs for fraction reduction. Uh, they're, you know, mostly meant for a guide or, you know, a generic, um, this is what um, the plate probably will sit on the patient uh, and be, um, you know, anatomically correct. Um, but that's not necessarily the case for a lot of, um, a lot of patients. So uh, many implants, um, you want to make sure you're um, bringing that plate um, straight down to the bone, uh, whether it's pre-contouring it um, or, or bending it. Uh, or utilizing um, non-locking screws to bring that plate against the bone for your fixation. And then variable uh, angle locking. So this is kind of a newer, um, within the last, I don't know, 15 year technology um, where you can still lock some screws into plates uh, in this quote unquote variable angle. So um, some uh, plates have, um, you know, five to 10 variable, uh, angle locking, uh, 10 to 30, um, 30 to 40. Uh, and after that, it um, no longer really engages. But essentially, you can, uh, you don't have to go straight 90 degrees, which you used to have to uh, for these locking screws. You can um, uh, angle it, angle the screw itself, uh, whether it's, you know, like I said, 10 to 30 or, or 40 degrees. Um, and it, the, uh, locking screw still locks into the plate uh, and doesn't compromise anything, um, provides more flexibility with putting in locking screws, um, especially when you're in joints uh, or around a fracture site itself. You want to be able to angle it um, away from uh, certain areas. Uh, so that's what this variable angle locking system, uh, which you'll hear a lot, um, especially with the newer technology stuff. Um, that's what that is. Um, referring to. I think you'll find that companies will use this a lot of times as a way to sell their plate to you. Um, they love to say, you know, well, so-and-so's plate only has 10 degree variable angle. Ours needs 20 degree variable angle. So you'll, you'll hear them talk about that a lot in plate design. Some other types of fixation that we haven't touched on. Um, our K wires is one option. Um, so they can get you positional stability. You can use them as temporary fixation. You can leave them in. Um, we can actually, you know, if you believe that this bent K wire can get you some compression, 
Um, that's an old school technique of doing chevrons or even first temperature fusions here. Don't tell Dr. Boyk that that's old school though. Uh, tension band wiring. So tension band, there's two images here because I want to dispel a myth. Tension band is going to convert forces that distract into compression. So you end up using this construct here. We use a couple wires and you just make a figure eight with the band. And it's really only used where you're going to have a tendon pulling that's going to reroute those forces with a tension band wiring into compressing that fifth metatarsal fracture. Um, maybe sometimes you see it at the deltoid, but really it needs to have a tendon pulling so you can take distraction forces and convert them into compression forces. Um, oftentimes we see a little x-ray right there. And we see a little bit of wire in a proximal phalanx of the hallux. This is not tension band wiring, although it's the same material. This is just circlage wire um, that can be used to fixate small osteotomies. Not that one. I agree. Um, so intramedullary, narrow, intramedullary nailing. Um, this is one of Dr. Clardy's specialties. This is not his case though, don't worry. So with IM nails, um, both uh, through the knee and uh, through the heel, um, what we're really trying to get is uh, relative stability. We get indirect uh, reduction. You know, we're not, um, although we can uh, manually reduce or even use um, a reverse hinterman uh, to compress the joints, um, these nails are really meant for um, an indirect reduction of uh, either a fusion or fracture um, um, to provide compression. Um, and callus is one of the best things we can see with IM nails um, where we have a little bit of motion, um, but yet stability uh, in order to you know, um, create some kind of uh, osseous bridging. You're restoring are reestablishing length and alignment um, of whatever fracture you're talking about. Um, you know, we like to do these for um, osteopenic, um, older uh, ankle fracture, pilon fractures, um, where you're trying to reestablish, you know, um, a functional limb um, and prevent rotation of the limb. And you're not really trying to get um, true anatomical, an anatomical reduction. You're just trying to get it as close to, to um, normal as you can uh, and let the body do the rest. So it's typically done with non-invasive or uh, minimally invasive um, uh, techniques. Um, so most of these are poke hole, uh, besides the prepping of the joint, everything else is pretty much poke hole stuff. The biggest incision being on the bottom of the heel uh, when we're um, uh, drilling and then shoving the nail up um, from distal to proximal. Um, it's not uh, load bearing, but rather uh, load sharing. Um, so you're kind of transferring all the weight from the uh, posterior heel up to the um, uh, leg. Um, and like I said, it's ideal for tibial diaphyseal fractures, uh, metaphyseal fractures, um, as well as for um, uh, fusions, GTC fusion. Something about this nail here. We usually always proximally, we're going to have two screws. And distally, we're gonna have one going through the talus, which is absent here. And we have two going through the calcaneus or one talus and calcaneus. These ones have been removed. They fell out on their own. Um, but up top, some points of confusion are about the holes here. So when you have a cylindrical hole like that versus an oblong hole below it, when we, if we were to put a screw in the cylindrical hole, it's gonna make sure that this proximal nail is all locked up because nothing is gonna move around that small little uh, screw to hole interface. But if you were to remove it and you were to dynamize a nail, that would mean that the only screws remaining up top are in these oblong holes. And that would allow a little bit of movement of the nail around those screws and you can get some micro motion there. And some people like to dynamize these to get that a little bit of motion so it's not too stiff and help with their fusions. 
Um, now we're just going to cover some images here, and I know we're going to run over on time a little bit, so we'll just go through them. Um, here's an example of fixations of metallic uh, PIPJ implants. Um, we can tell it's cannulated because there's K wires going down the middle of it. So K wires are utilized a lot on toes for uh, PIPJ arthrodesis. If you have a toe that's really elevated still or deviated in a transverse plane, you can drive the wire across the MPJ for added stability. Um, whenever you check these post-op, if you think that the screw or a wire may have moved, try to compare to the prior image or the floral image to see if it's backed out um, because our patients sometimes walk earlier than they should and they move. Um, K-wire sizes for this are usually 0 0.054, 0 0.062 in size. Those are 0 0.035 <laughs> wires, those tiny implants. Those ones had to go down the implant, so those are really small. Next, we have a staple, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, depending on which company rep you talk to, um, they'll tell you about how great the compression of the staple is. You usually have some sort of um, nitinol or, or memory to it. So that way, once you put it in, it compresses. Um, and then we have wild osteotomy screws there, which are usually around 2.0, give or take half a centimeter in the direction. Once we get into the first metatarsal, um, we're dealing with screws that could probably be as small as a 2.7, um, but usually are going to max out around 3.0 or 3.5. Um, 3.0 is a fairly common size for this. Um, and we can see the nice headless compression placement across the osteotomy site there. As we move further into the midfoot, we're going to use screws around a 4.0. So the 4.0 screw across the first TMT is usually a very common one. Um, and then screws in a plate there would probably be in the range of around 3.5. Um, you could go, I guess, as small as 2.7 if you had a smaller person. Um, but usually you're doing 3.5 screws in that range um, for locking screws or 4.0. When you get into the midfoot, this is an example of a bridge type plate where they had a Liz Frank fracture dislocation. Um, and then there's also a, a compression screw going across that uh, Liz Frank uh, ligament. We have that cannulated uh, headless compression screw there. Um, again, same thing. These are going to be relatively around a 3.5 or 4.0. If you get out into the uh, fifth metatarsal, there's a lot of options for this. Um, this is a good x-ray to show you how important it is to make sure you measure multiple times or place your k-wire appropriately your guide wire appropriately so you're not actually going out through the plantar cortex here um, if we look on the oblique it's getting pretty close and medially it's getting pretty close uh, on that ap there um, but a screw for a fifth metatarsal don't call it an im nail this is an im screw they can be partially threaded to get compression across that or sometimes people put a fully threaded one sometimes people drill cannulated because it's easier and then put in a solid one because it's more stable um, but either way the size of the screw um, is usually achieved by tapping this is one of the very few places that we tap so we don't crack that cortex and you can actually see what size diameter is appropriate once you feel some resistance um, but this is probably going to be anywhere between a 4.0 and a 6.0 probably usually around a 5.0 As we move back into the uh, mid-tarsal joint, um, the screw growing across the TN, that's more of a positional screw here because it's fully threaded and it wasn't lagged. That's a 5-0 screw there. Um, the remaining screws in the plate are a are 4 -0 screws. Um, I think even a 3-5 for that compression screw. When we go back into the calcaneus, this is where we can get to our real biggest screws. Um, you can have anything from a 5-0 if you're just doing a calcaneal slide. Um, but these ones here are probably six, five screws on the right. And it looks like they would be the same on the left, but you can actually get up to an eight O in that area. If you have a large person, these are the ones from before that showed the headless compression on the left and the headed on the right. Um, ankle screws. So if we're going down the ankle for, and we're doing percutaneous screws, maybe for a tripod ankle fusion technique, those are going to be same thing as the calcaneous six, five, uh, or maybe eight O's. Um, if we're talking about a lag screw for a fibular fracture first, 
Um, the smallest you might get is a two seven, but usually a three five for that, along with three five screws in the plate. Um, and then these screws in the anterior plate were three fives or four O's. Um, and then if we look at the syndesmosis, we have a plate um, with two smaller screws, probably three five screws holding the plate down. And then we're usually using a three five or a four O screw going across the syndesmosis. Um, those ones are not usually over drilled. Um, you want to hold your position by dorsiflexing the foot and getting a neutral position there and not over compress. There's also, a, uh, you can do a huge literature search to talk about whether you should use one screw, two screws, three cortices, four cortices. Um, if you engage in that distal cortex, it does hold a little bit more stability and compression. Whereas if you put a screw in that stops midway through, it's technically not incorrect, but you can have more uh, windshield wipering there where you actually get the screw kind of toggling in that metaphyseal bone and it would be less stable. Um, also, if the screws do break here and you need to take them out, coring it out from the outside is an option if you want. Otherwise, we just leave them um, if they're quad cortical. I know he was flying through that right there, but does anybody know why? So if you're reducing the syndesmosis and you don't want to over compress that syndesmosis, why would you dorsiflex the foot? It's a little point, but it's an important point because over or under correction of a syndesmosis can be a really big deal. Would it be because the uh, talus, I guess, anteriorly yeah. is wider? Yes, and exactly. So it Exactly. So it can prevent over reducing that syndesmosis. So I think little point, but important mm -hmm. point. Um, so summarizing all of that, that we just, that we just sort of went through quickly. So think back to fixation construct. It's going to be different for every patient, right? N equals one. So every fracture is different. Um, every fracture is going to have a different pattern to it, a different personality than the last one that you fixed that looked just like it. And every patient is going to be different. Um, so I think the good surgeon and the good rep um, has a plan going into it as far as your fixation construct, um, but you also have backup plans B and backup plan C and maybe backup plan D, depending on, on what you're going into. Um, so again, associate simple fracture patterns um, with direct um, absolute stability, direct reduction, absolute stability. So your lag screws, your compression plates versus complex or comminuted fractures associate with indirect reduction. You're trying to attain relative stability. So we kept using that example of an IM nail or bridge plating. Um, and then, you know, it always goes back to good dissection technique, a good technique overall, I guess. So don't forget about your soft tissues. Um, we often have this hefty focus on bone and how the heck we're going to get it back in anatomical alignment. Uh, but I'll tell you, soft tissue can ruin a case real fast. Uh, so don't forget about that part. That's all we got. Yeah, for you. thanks for having us tonight. Does anybody have any questions? Sounds good. I guess that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you guys very much. Um, very informative. Also, thank you fourth years for chiming in and, and giving us your uh, personal experiences from interviews and externships. And uh, we look forward to hearing more from Steps in the future. Have a good I night. I do everyone. want to add one thing as you thank the fourth years, if any of them are still around. But I think the thing that was missed most in the second and third year education this past year was not being around fourth years. I think that if you can try to pick their brains over the next month before everybody leaves, it would really be beneficial. Um, the example they can set for you is these, you have some outstanding fourth years. So try to get some knowledge from them before they leave. All right, guys, have a good night.